This is the last lecture video on modern theories of international trade and by modern I mean theories developed after the HOS model. In the previous video I talked about trade between rich countries and this is intra-industry variety trade that is mm, countries export and import similar products or within the same industrial group intra-industry trade. In the previous lecture video we have also discussed the characteristics of industrialized or developed nations and that is their these markets are characterized by imperfect competition and what we'll be using is monopolistic competition which has some elements of monopoly and some elements of competition and the second concept which characterizes uh, industrialized countries is the concept of economies of scale. That is, the more you produce, the more is the factor productivity. And when factor productivity is higher, lower is the average cost of production. And when average cost of production is lower, you bring down prices. And I have also talked about the fact that people would like to choose from a wide variety of goods which are similar but not exactly the same or they have demand for differentiated products. So now let us look at a model which explains intra-industry trade. The model to develop intra-industry trade is due to various economists like Helpman, Krugman, Lancaster. So we can call this the HKL model and this was published around 1979 and this is how they intuitively explain intra-industry trade. The first thing we already know this is a trade between similar economies developed countries and this takes place because of economies of scale or IRS and imperfect competition. And we know economies of scale means that the more a firm produces, lower is the average cost of production. Imperfect competition or imperfect markets means that consumers have a demand for similar but not exactly the same product or what is differentiated product. Now, given all this, if a country is not open to foreign trade, different firms will try to satisfy demand for differentiated products but they will not be able to produce more output why because it will be limited by the size of the country because it does not engage in foreign trade and thus and thus they are likely to charge a relatively higher price for their products in an attempt to satisfy demand for differentiated products and why would they charge a higher price because when they produce lower amounts of output because of economies of scale the average cost of production will be higher and thus they will charge a higher price. Now when these countries open to international trade each firm faces the world market or the larger world market and international competition amongst different sellers across different countries they will force the firms to lower the price of their product and bring it down closer to the average cost of production. Now all this can be achieved by each firm producing larger quantity of output of a few variety of products and when they produce more and more the average cost declines and hence they can charge a much lower price. So if they focus on production of few variety of products then the average cost of production will be lower and hence they will charge a lower price. At the same time firms are interested in creating brand loyalty and strive for larger market share and then they spend a lot more money in R&D or research and development to come up with more appealing products as well as to undertake cost cutting measures. Thus the international competition or international trade forces companies to produce large quantities 
of few products. This is important to keep the cost low. Thus, a nation produces a few variety of a product and imports others. That is why U.S. Boeing company produces aircrafts, so U.S. exports aircrafts, but then it also imports aircrafts from Europe through this company called Airbus. And thus, from a consumer's perspective, they have more choices, and all these are available at a lower price. And this is how we can explain intra-industry trade using the concept of monopolistic competition or imperfect competition and economies of scale. Now let us look at two real world examples and how different countries have benefited from foreign trade, which is of intra-industry variety. Now before 1958, or before the formation of European Union. And what is European Union done? One of the important contribution of European Union is it has reduced the trade barriers or barriers to foreign trade between different European countries. But before 1958, there were a lot of barriers to trade in terms of taxes, in terms of how much could be imported, exported, and so on. So before 1958, where foreign trade was very restricted because of taxes and so on amongst different European countries, each country would produce a wide variety of cars because consumers had demand for differentiated products. But since these companies' production was limited to the size of each country's market, they would produce less, and hence when they produce less because of economies of scale, the average cost of production was higher, and hence the consumers paid a much higher price for each car before 1958. After 1958, with the formation of European Union, where they reduced or eliminated trade barriers between countries, what we have found is there has been a reduction in average cost of production, and that has resulted in lower prices to the consumers. And how has this happened? This has happened because there has been a surge in intra-industry trade in the European Union. And this has been accompanied by a huge reduction in average cost. So what firms started doing in European Union after the trade barriers were eliminated or reduced is they started focusing on the larger market for different in different countries within the European Union. And what they did is they focused on producing fewer varieties of cars, and but they produced a whole lot. And so, so the French would export their cars to other countries in Europe and also import cars from other countries in Europe. And hence, the consumers benefited because they had wider variety of options available and they were now paying a much lower price. And an economist by the name of Bela Balasa, he found this kind of a phenomena, a surge in intra-industry trade for accompanied by a reduction in average cost of production, not just in cars, in washing machines and other manufactured products. Look at another example of intra-industry trade. Before 1965, US and Canada had trade barriers or taxes and other kind of barriers in terms of exports and imports of cars. Now, in terms of the size of the economy, Canadian economy is much smaller than the US economy. And before 1965, <clears throat> The size of the Canadian market was one-tenth of the U.S. market in terms of cars, and the average cost of production or average cost to produce a car in Canada was about 30% higher than what we had in the U.S. So in 1965, U.S. and Canada signed what is called an auto pact, 
That eliminated all tear trade barriers between these two countries in terms of exporting and importing of cars. Now with this auto pact, which was signed in 1965, the exports and imports of cars have increased with each firm producing a small variety of large quantity of cars. And now consumers have more choices at a lower cost. So here are two examples which explain intra-industry trade. Now some important points about different trade models starting from HOS model. Now one thing we know is inter-industry trade that is trade across industry is likely to be higher between countries that have large differences in factor endowments, the HOS model. And intra-industry trade is likely to be higher in similarly placed economies, which are similar in terms of size and factor proportions. And we know intra-industry trade is based on economies of scale and product differentiation. So this is the first point. The second point you should note is the following. In case of inter-industry model, pre-trade prices predict pattern of trade like we studied under HOS model. In case of intra-industry trade, pre-trade relative prices may no longer accurately predict the pattern of foreign trade because with opening of foreign trade, the country which was producing very little of some good may start producing a huge amount of that good and hence become a dominant player and an exporter of that good. Look at the third point and this is interesting and important. In contrast to the HOS model, the HOS model predicts that foreign trade will lower the return to a country's scarce factor. For example, in the US, labor is relatively scarce and so foreign trade harms the scarce factor according to the HOS model when it explains inter-industry trade. And what people have found is with intra-industry trade based on economies of scale, it is possible for all factors to gain. So no factor loses because of foreign trade. That is why we hear so many concerns about trade between US and China or US and India and not so much about trade between US and Germany, all because of the difference between inter and intra industry trade and how it impacts returns to factors. The fourth point to note is intra industry trade is related to sharp increase in international trade in parts or components of the product. And in a way, this can be considered to be an extension of the HOS model. The five fifth point, the one I really like, is by Lancaster. Even with intra-industry trade, comparative advantage is somewhere in the background. And one could safely say that inter-industry trade is based on natural comparative advantage and intra-industry trade reflects acquired comparative advantage. And that is what different countries need to focus on on that is how can they acquire comparative advantage so this completes our discussion of international trade model thank you for your time